to know the artist behind the epic melodies, songs, and beats. Celebrating the best new music from around the world. This is the A State of Trance Podcast. Hey, what's up? My name is Ruben Ronde and this is another A State of Trance Podcast. And I have uh, someone very special in the studio celebrating the release of his album Open Up The Night. Gary McCartney, a.k.a. Ejeka, a.k.a. Transwax. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ruben. How do I introduce you? Like, is it yeah, Gary? Uh, is it Transwax? Is it Jack? I have enough names, I think. Is um, there is there more than these? <laughs> no, well, yeah, if you go back far enough. Um, well, let's go far back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I suppose Irish names don't roll off the tongue. So my uh, real name is Gary McCartney. And there's just a lot of syllables in that. So that's why I, I pulled it into a Jacka. <laughs> Because, oh, there you um, go. It makes lots of sense. Yeah, I think people find their own name strange to hear. I don't know if Dutch people find that. Yeah, oh, well, you try to pronounce my name in the right way. Ruben de Ronde. Ruben van de Ronde. Yeah, Ruben. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Fantastic. No. No, it might just be an Irish thing, but most um, guys seem to come, go under an alias. I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe it's because I got bullied at school. <laughs> well, uh, are you are you fam- family of Paul McCartney? You have to um, do that. Yeah, I get that all the time. I I, I get hotels that would go like, oh, you're a relation to Paul McCartney. And I'd go, I wouldn't be staying at this hotel if it was. <laughs> well, they, maybe you should say over. yes. Maybe say yes, you get upgraded to like a honeymoon yeah, suite or something like that. With guitars on the wall. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, in this podcast, we always go back into, the, into your history. And I have a couple of uh, fan questions as well. So uh, I like to start at the start. Yep. Um, Going back all the way in time, Belfast, many moons ago, uh, how did you fall in love with dance music? What triggered you to become a uh, DJ producer? But before that, how did you get in touch with dance music? Yeah, um, I suppose I would have been like 10 and having um, two older brothers, both in the dance music, really mm-hmm. helped. I think that's a common story whenever you have older siblings. Um, and Radio 1 was the big thing back then, like, especially at a weekend, you had Judge Jules, Dave Pierce, Seb Fontaine, and then the Essential Mix. Yeah. And in the grand old days before the internet, you used to have to, like, tape things on, well, cassette, and then it was mini disc and things. So yeah. for me, I didn't really go, it was like people that went out and ran about the streets and had fun when they were young, but I just sat in the house recording, like, Radio 1 or going on, like, early versions of, um, Napster in the day oh, things, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. on 56k modems downloading like there was a one hour time limit on the internet and you could just about get a 7 minute <laughs> mv3 and no one could call you anymore because no. your line was busy I, they, they were in the bad books if they rang at that time but yeah uh, that, that's early memories for me just uh, listening to Radio 1 um, people like Carl Cox um, then Tiesto then Armin you know I started actually with techno yeah. a bit, and then into trance because that was mixed quite quite a common thing for guys like Coxie to play techno and trance. Yeah. So he, he sort of, I was like, what's this music? And then it branched out listening to like the Dutch guys, the German guys from there. So um, yeah, early memories of just listening to the radio and um, it got a bit older and done record shopping. There was a store in Belfast called Mixmaster, mm-hmm. a great record shop. Um, and I think I was the only guy that asked for like techno and trance. It was like a very like fine line in Belfast if you, had one to one or the other, yeah, and I was the guy in the middle. Um, so yeah, even back then, just trying to explore different genres. So, your two brothers were already clubbing, I guess, at a certain point. You, yeah. you were just sitting at home listening to um, that's it. Radio One, yeah. They would tell me about the DJs they'd seen that weekend. Um, like one, one of the brothers was more into like daft punk, so like housey stuff, and the other one was into like faster tempo, yeah. Um, so to me, it was always dance music, you know, just from being young, yeah. So when you go when you went for, to your first let's say rave, yep. did one of your brothers <laughs> took along uh, took yeah, you along so for the first time? Like fifteen, going to Planet Love. Have you heard of that? Yeah, it's in Belfast. Yeah, and, um, yeah. and yeah, you would have like the trance stage. I would have everyone in the day. It was the, the main event in Ireland every year that you could get all the big acts in. Yeah. So yeah, um, it's a big Mario Picado fan again because he done trance and techno. Yeah. And tech trance, <laughs> which is another genre. Yeah. Of music. Um, so the, yeah, the BXR nucleus. Yeah, uh, timeless. Some of them records. Um, and then to be fair, that when I started playing trance in my sets, that would be the first things I was doing the piccolo type stuff because it wasn't as pure trancey. Mm-hmm. Sort of worked well in the house or a techno set. So um, yeah, going to see people at Planet Love was the first big festival I was at. So you were fifteen 
You yeah, went to the festival? Fake, fake ID. Fake ID. <laughs> yeah. You took your brother's ID with you? Well, no, there was a website. It wouldn't be about now, but it used to just, it used to take like a week to come in a jiffy <laughs> bag, unmarked, you know. Um, the early terrible, days of the dark web. <laughs> yeah. I've, I'm, I'm assuming you can get a fake ID probably in like an hour now from an internet um, website, but then it took like a week. Um, it was like, a, like one of them international student cards or something yeah. it was called. So you were... Really uh, Hans uh, Schlunzlein uh, from <laughs> yes. Germany. McLovin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so, okay, you went for the rave for the first time when you were 15. And then uh, the next step, like I said, you're going to record shops. Yeah. Did you already DJ when you went to the festivals for the first time when you were 15? Or was it something that you were picking uh, up later? It's quite a funny story. Um, I assume you know that Technics 1210s were never cheap. Oh, they were so expensive. And they're I so went for bell drives. Yeah, yeah. I, I say, I actually went with... Like one arm for a year and just had one because my dad refused to buy me two because they were too dear. <laughs> so I I had to practice on like one vinyl deck and then like a calm KCD 1000 with like the little dual layered. Yeah. So I was learning to mix vinyl on one deck for about a year before my dad, he thought I would just give up the hobby and he wouldn't have to splash the cash a year later. Yeah. And like, it's like a year later, right dad, where's the other? So did you put on like a cassette and then try to beat match with one? Yeah, it was the CD and the, and the old, okay. old CD decks weren't great. You know, like you look at the CDJs now, it's like a computer. Yeah. The um the old the old CD decks were very like... Skippy. Uh, you hit the wrong button and the whole thing powers down. <laughs> kind of thing. So yeah, but uh, to be fair, I think that's how I learned mixing quite well because he's just concentrating on one bit of kit and mastering it that's, yeah. and still with my music production there's so much stuff you can get baffled by if you just concentrate on one, that's one true. thing and learn it that um, is true so yeah, yeah that, that, that's how it started so you started DJing um, with yeah, one but, with one player and a yeah. CD player what was the next step that uh, did you already do some shows after that before no, you started producing or how did it so go down? Um, as I said I was quite a nerd I think the guys I know would have went out and got DJ gigs on the rage playing in like bars in Belfast and they were like 15, 16, but I didn't have my first gig. Oh, there's, there was a really dodgy DJ competition I'd done once. Mm -hmm. And my friends like tried to like bribe people to give me votes. I still lost. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll skip that and go to the, go to the cool gig, I think. It was this goes well with <laughs> false identifications, <laughs> <and> <laughs> false votes. There we go. <laughs> Sound like some sort of criminal. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I think Pete Tong started playing my music when I was... 23, 24 yeah. and then gigs came quite quickly off that and then I made the jump to London so it was it, it was a lot of production time in between I sort of had to sell some of my records too to pay for university you know yeah. I studied economics trying to do the real thing yeah. and um, got very bored with that and then you know sort of tried to be normal for a few years and just learning production but um, yeah I think um, they had Jack uh, Essential New Tune was like when I was 24, 25 and then, before you know it, you're getting gig requests just off the back of that. So yeah. the gap in between them was all about me holding the skills. I think the first um, production thing I remember is there was an ATB to like come computer music edition where it taught you how to make it in Cubase and give you the little sound fonts yeah. of how to do the guitar twang and the beats. So I can remember Cubase was the first DAW I used and then in the Fruity Loops, um, and then Reason, and then in the Ableton. So in, in that period between, it was like 16 to 24. Was you were it? trying out different yeah. dolls. Um, so there was a lot of like, it was computer magazines then, it wasn't YouTube. So there was a lot of just studying and um, learning things. I'm trying to study at university. Which didn't go at that the same well. time, yeah. Didn't go that well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Priorities, to, right? Yeah. I, I think that's when I knew I wanted to do music because the real world scared me so much. Really? <laughs> well, yeah. It's like a sort of an escape. Like. Well, yeah. You know, like, you know what you love in life. When you're in your early 20s, you quickly figure out, you know, what you like. So, uh, yeah, that, that was probably it. How, how did you find the balance with, with, with studying and then producing, like learning how to produce at the same time? How did you... I manage everything. Well, I, I got a third in my degree, so I think that tells. <laughs> you know, and I didn't do that well in, in my degree. And my dad's a lecturer at that university, yeah. so he's very disappointed. So but, we were living up to, uh, yeah. <laughs> didn't live up to expectations. Yeah, yeah. but um, I, the, t the time I didn't spend studying, I was learning music. You know, yeah. I could have done a music, should have done music production or something. Yeah, I've never had any formal music. But it training. wasn't really a big thing back then, I guess. Like no. it was really hard to. At least from my experience, I remember I still have at home. I have like a proper book with 
that explains how the wave bundles work yeah, or man. something like that. It was just different. Or you would buy Future Music Magazine with the latest tips of Ableton 5. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It, it, it's mad. Like, if I was, I was 16, 17 again, yeah. you could spend a week and learn everything just on YouTube. It's mind-blowing. Back then, it was like, you just had to take what was given to you every month in a music magazine. Yeah. It mightn't have been your style of music or the, the music software you knew. We just but, pick up the, the like EQing trips and yeah. tricks and stuff like that. But yeah, that, I had no formal music education yeah. per se. I just learned myself from doing that. Yeah. Um, but you're right, a lot, lot trickier back then. <laughs> well, it, it's not necessarily that you missed out on anything because no. you're doing quite well, sir, <laughs> if I may say. Um, I, I went back into your history a little bit and then, and then I saw something that you first... Proper release, correct me if I'm wrong, was um, all the way back in 2012 with an artist that is massive right now, Bicep. Oh, yes. The, the Tell us about it. Like, I'm talking about you, of course. And that was, I think, if I look back, that was one of your first releases. Yeah, well, I think I met them guys. So, my best friend from school lived with them at university in Newcastle. Yeah. And Matt, one of the guys, he was always playing music and was yeah. sort of had a, it was a minimal house we were in back then. Yeah. Remember that era? Yeah. Where it was just like plop, plop. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we ended into that, but then we quickly realized we're in the other music, trance, techno. I think guys were big into disco back then. Mm -hmm. um, and I had that vocal loop on you that just as an idea and I sent it to Matt and he worked on it. Yeah. Um, and it was out, I think Sasha was the fun, first DJs to play it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a big idol to both of us. Um, so like, I think there, uh, both of us have expanders, probably one of our favorite tracks. So for yeah. him, the play lap was a big moment. Uh -huh. And I'm signed it to Oz Music, which is quite a big label, and still yeah. is. Mm -hmm. And um, them guys played a boiler room and then put it on the boiler room and the boiler room was quite a new thing. Yeah. So that was sort of how... Like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, here? it was um, hard to believe. There was a time before boiler room, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, but so... Yeah, that, that's how that kicked off. Um, and obviously, if you listen to you and what the Bicep Boys are doing now, that's sort of quite a there's a trend of their music. It, it reflects even that, that early track as to what they're doing, like sort of lush, relaxing euphoria. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Or as I sort of change my music style, it's fit in the same realm, but I change quite quite a lot every year because I get bored. Yeah, them guys have fit a very nice story from. Them early tracks to what sticking to their guns, yeah. basically, or, or mastering their art. Would, yeah, um, but if you can definitely hear the, the emotion of that track and what they're doing now is very similar. Did you ever talk with them afterwards or recently? Because yeah, I, yeah. Well, um, they're very busy with their live show, yeah. and um, myself and Matt both became new fathers recently. So trying yeah. to balance touring and babies is a common, which is impossible. Yeah, <laughs> basically, there's no answer. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we, we do. Um, them guys are just very busy. Um, but it'd be great to do something again at some point. Um, maybe something completely different. You know, do something that's not what we've done before. Yeah. In a way, which is sort of what we've done with you. We were both making house tracks then and yeah. that isn't sort of breakbeat trance. So just doing something that's completely outside what you normally do is always a good thing. I think that definitely, um, that's, that could be a good combination. I would love to hear that, to be honest. Yes. Yeah, from, from there on, um, well, you did a bunch of releases as uh, Jaka. Uh, you did the together EP, mostly EPs, I guess. Yeah, different that, different that uh, rules and litmus yeah. EPs every, let's say every two years, I guess. Yep. Um, and then fast forward. I'm really going fast forward right now. <laughs> no, I've, you, done, yeah. I've done a lot of releases. You did a <laughs> lot of releases. Um, because something important, I guess, in your career that you started releasing bootleg vinyls from 2016. As that was, I guess, that was the the birth of Transwix, right? Yeah, and I, I think. Um, I I just love the idea of releasing playable trance music. Yeah, I think everyone. And this was far beyond like the vinyl era ever, and yeah. also before the revival of vinyl. Yeah, again. like if you had plotted a graph of when trance music had fallen out of love and vinyl had fallen out of love, this is when I started. <laughs> this, would <be> <laughs> this would be the, the dip. <laughs> I sort of do the opposite. That's what I have in my head sometimes. So yeah, that trying to slow trance tracks down is difficult. Yeah, but I find from listening to like Chicane and stuff, he used to put breakbeats in. Like Chicane tracks are seen as trans tracks, but they're sitting around one thirty BPM. Yeah, I was always trying to figure out. But beyond the fact they're masterpieces, why 
does this work? And he used a lot of break beats and stuff yeah. to sort of add more groove to it. So I, I was taking sort of tracks I like, slowing them down and adding more like jungle and garage type um, beats to them um, just to make it a bit different. And then I think it's 2018, I'd done the Essential Mix mm-hmm. for Trance Wax and I think it was the first Trance Essential Mix in like a decade maybe. I think so, yeah. Did Was that because you were releasing all these vinyls and uh, I guess a lot of people started to rip them and put put stuff online and, and yeah. put DJs in their sets. I think yeah, Charlotte DeWitt quite early on when she started played the um, Eve's Droider Back to Earth remix of done. Yeah, which isn't isn't a great isn't a great remix, but it slowed it down and sort of cut out the you know it's a big track though. Like I've played the original still, but some DJs were scared because it was like, what am I meant to do with this track? So yeah. just slowing it down and toughening it up. Yeah, a bit a bit. So yeah. Girls like her were playing it, um, and then it moved into people like Solomon, um, Adriatic, some of the minimal tech, um, melodic techno guys have, have played it a lot. Um, Job Jose, yeah, yeah, big, yeah, uh, big Dutch DJ. Yeah. Um, so guys like that. So it was quite, I would say, quite an underground crew of DJs started playing the the bootlegs um, and asking me for them, um, and then this whole idea of it being a limited edition vinyl. Beyond the um the legal side of it, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying it's present bootle- company it's, included. It's bootleg. It's bootleg vinyls, yeah, but right? That's the you can remember. Which I didn't list the tracks either. It was just Transvex one, and yeah, two, and three. Anonymous, and, yeah. Set. Um, but you can remember seeing white labels of bootlegs in the day. You know, um, you know the crazy mashups that shouldn't make sense. And I think one one I played still is the Camusera Lizard yeah. mashup. I yeah. remember getting that from Hard to Find Records like years ago, and I play it. Every set still goes off. There's two tracks that shouldn't sound good together, but, but if it wasn't for a white label, <laughs> it, wouldn't, it would never have come out. So there's a, there's a, there's a nice sort of risky, obscure risk of obscurity about having white labels and what they do. And the anonymous side of it, people seem to get, everything's quite labeled and, you know, social media focused. And you have, you have something that just sort of people can't get and it's anonymous. Yeah. Well, Transrex was anonymous for a long time. In the meantime, yeah. we were just doing AJK stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, how did you dis- when did you decide to be like, okay, now things are popping off because people are playing all these bootlegs, these vinyls. If you look them up right now on, on sites, yeah. they go for 500 quid yeah. per piece. It's, it's nuts. People want them. Um, when was the moment there for you that you were like, okay, let's embrace this whole Transrex thing and just start doing more with this? Yeah, it was, the, it was definitely like the fun fun side of playing trance I, uh, I, I've i never played a trance set out you know it was only house and as a jacker and I would yeah. used to drop like maybe like high gate pitching or like synth and strings by your man they were like yeah. okay sort of dance music at the end of my a jacker sets and then they were getting sneak really, them in a little bit and then they were getting better reactions than all the, yeah. the hour and a half before it and I was like wait a minute people are really getting to love these records again so um just sort of floated the idea that it was doing like trance sets and um, it just started, people started to get fascinated by it. They seemed to work a lot at festivals as well. It was like a fun thing. I think I'd done a, a set at Life Festival like five years ago in Ireland. It was like two in the morning. It was raining everywhere and everyone huddled into a tent. It was, like, it was meant to hold like 200 people and there was about 400 crammed in. <laughs> and I played um, Cosmic Gate. Um, Exploration of space. Of space. <laughs> And somebody lit a big flare in the tent and it just got recorded. So it's a magical moment. And like, like people still message me saying that was the best, one of the best festival moments. You get the right track, especially at a festival, yeah. at the right um, time, the right environment, it rained and everyone's crowded in and it was just perfect. And no other genre can do that with a big breakdown. Like, <laughs> house records are great, but like, trance is the one that really seems to hit a nerve with people. Yeah. Very true. So that's, yeah, okay, that was one of the, f- the first times that you were moving into um, being Transvex more than a Jekka maybe, or? Yeah, I think I think in my head I was always like, I've, I've like as I said, I made eight, I was making trance back when I was 16, you know, I was yeah. making like trying to copy ATB and things like that, very like basic tracks I was trying to learn. And I was like, I've always made trance, why don't I try and make trance music? I like, and then my favorite places in the studio. So um, I think I was, in, I was away one summer and I started playing with ideas and I brought it back to the studio. And that was like sort of the founding ideas for my first album on Anjuna. Mm-hmm. Quite breaky still, Chicane-esque. Yeah. Um, and then that was 2020 when it got yeah. released. Yeah. 
So I, yeah, it was sort of hit, hit during COVID. So it was seen as quite a like easy listening album yeah. in my head. But that's why I've really relished in the Armada one. They really explore the club side of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, before we get to the new album, Open, Open of the Night, I I want to dive into something else because in 2021 you released a hardcore rave <laughs> mixtape kind of thing, yeah. and then a year later you do a French filter house kind of album on the Ajeka. Is that yeah. because you get bored all the time with, with the stuff that you're making or is it just that you wanna, don't want to focus on one thing and just do as much as you can? I think um, I've never been diagnosed with ADHD but if you look at my discography <laughs> I might tell a lot. Well, by, here, here you go. Diagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I mean. I think a lot of music guys especially creative people their heads don't think like normal people so I, uh, that might make sense but I love doing them type of things. I came up brother was into Daft Punk and Cassius quite early, quite early on so yeah. it's always been a, another that's why I did the French filter yeah. house kind of thing yeah um, the plans to do another one of them next for next summer yeah. and um, the hardcore thing like my other brother was into like Tizer and like Happy Hardcore well we called it Happy Hardcore it was sort of 160 like the, um, kick drums over was Tom beans. Harding BK yeah yeah, that early stuff even Coxies to play Happy Hardcore at the start so try to do a mixtape like that, Scooter type vocals, you know, these things like that. But again, you look at people like Scooter still selling like huge arenas. People will never go. Um, yeah. So yeah, in my in my head, I'm always trying to relive the first time I heard whatever type of music it was. Um, so yeah, um, trance is definitely my first love, but if, if you go back, I've listened to all sorts of music. So trying to recreate them moments. So basically what you, you just, Chase nostalgia all the time yeah, in the I studio. That's my favorite word. Um, yeah. And I think it's like, it's up, it's like another sense. You know, you have smell, like you can have hearing, but if you combine like everything, it'd be like, God, that reminds me of that exact moment. Yeah. I, I think music is the, one of the only like, you know, yeah, you're in a certain situation and yeah. the, there was this tune was playing in the background yeah. or I was at this rave and this tune was being yeah. played. You know, and it's it's huge. I don't know if everyone. I think everyone has that. But for me, it's a, it's an overpowering thing. Really, it defines who I am. All these yeah, moments. Yeah. So yeah, it, and that will never never go away. Yeah, know. that's well, that's that's a good Poignant. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I love it, man. Okay, so COVID happened. You released your first uh, album, which was more breakbeat kind of. We talked about this in the in the State of Trends episode as well. Um, clubs are getting open again. Something is happening in the UK. There's all these um, hardest sounds in dance. Well, not necessarily yeah. hardstyle or whatever. It's more like the donk music, the club hats, club caviar, uh, the, the the Euro dance as we call it over here in Europe. Yeah, This is all happening in the UK. Uh, I guess most people don't travel a lot yet because of COVID which is going on. Yep. And this, this, what is happening in the UK in, <laughs> in these times, like 2021, 2022? So um, my theory <laughs> is um, these tracks were big around 20 years ago and people who are 18 maybe younger 16 their mums and dads probably listen to this music ah. and still do, still do yeah like a, a gate crasher cd or a dave pierce mix or something like that definitely in the uk mix cds were a big thing and the kids must be getting it off their parents mm-hmm. and being like this is what i grew up with i love it too and they're going to the clubs and hearing what they have so heard. now you have these 18, 19, 20 years old yeah. going to clubs with nostalgia because they grew up with the music sitting in the car in the back yeah. because the parents played it in the on the way to whatever. Yeah, like my dad was into like Bob Dylan, Fleetwood Mac, yeah. you know, things like that. And I love that because he played it. Yeah. I also love the music, but say it's another generation removed of like dance music was that people are obsessed with dance music, yeah. especially the rave scene blowing up in the 90s. Like, that's probably what's happening, but um, that, that's, that's my philosophy. I, I, no, I think I think you're actually spot on. I never heard this theory before, but I think you're absolutely right. This, and it, this, and this could be it. It's yeah. also catchy, you know. A, a loop it's catchy, short it. loops. Yeah. It's it's. There's not a lot going on. There's just a good melody and a nice yeah. catchy vocal. It's easy. It's usable that's on TikTok. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's another side to it. You know. Yeah, you can't like, rock tracks are great, but it's really modern rock. You can really break down into like a thirty second. Yeah, like if you listen to again Fleetwood Mac or people like that, you have to listen to the whole song, and kids don't have time for that. So for these tracks, you can listen to eight seconds, you hear the whole song. Yep, that's it. You you get it, and you can 
you can you know enjoy it and act like you know what you're talking about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now let's yeah. let's talk about open of the night because while um a lot of typical trans artists i'm not gonna name any names but this is actually what ha- what is happening right now which is what i see on the socials and that and track list is that those trans artists are steering to the eurodance kind of yeah. feeling right now or um but you're doing the opposite you're going to the really the old school trend sounds like the Lange, Trail Seekers, those kind of feels in your track in the new album Open Up Tonight, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, I, I think that's the music that resonates with me. Yeah. And I I've, I feel I've created this sound of trans wax from a bootleg sort of idea to where it is now. And I'm not going to change all of a sudden because... Other forces are doing it. I just think of anything like do the opposite, yeah. as I said earlier. If things are going one way, go the other way and it'll come full circle. <laughs> yeah, and think my manager might not be too happy about that idea, <laughs> but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, yeah. Are and you are I, you happy with that? Looking at the manager. Right nod. Now. Yeah, he's nodding, so he's happy. Yeah, he's that, and like things like playing both breakdowns in a seven minute dance track is important to me. Yeah. I I very rarely miss mix out halfway through a track. And when people do it, the mind tracks get a bit annoyed. So, you know what I like mean? Stop I, editing these. It always yeah. happens in a state of trance also. Sorry. And, I, but I suppose for me, I always, if I didn't get a track the first break, then I might have got it the second. Yeah. Sometimes if you don't get a track, you just miss it. And before you know it, it's a few years before you hear it again. You're like, should have just listened to the whole thing? So, yeah. yeah. Um, definitely when I play like the bigger stages, like the um, state of trance, and like, I think there's an on June outdoor. Yeah. Playing things like Love Shy. And letting both drops hit really helps the crowd yeah. because they can get into it in the first drop and the second drop. They love it. And there's a chance to relive that. You know, I, I think it's important. So Maybe instant nostalgia. Yeah, that's it. It's a, a drip of dopamine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another one. Yeah. No, but, uh, yeah, I try and stick my, my, to my guns. Um, and yeah, uh, the person before me and after me might be kind of playing different music, but... I yeah, but, that, but that's like, fine. Yeah. It's a bit of diversity. So open up the night. You already told it on the uh, regular episode. Um, the album title is based upon that you are exploring more the tracks that you're playing in clubs, basically. Yeah. Opening up the night, uh, dance. It's, it's club music, basically, right? Yeah, well, I think dance music, the festival side's a huge thing. Yeah. And this could be a day outdoor festival where they may have nice lights, but nobody can see them. Whereas yeah. in a club... There's an intensity there. So for me, each track is something that should be played maybe more in the winter in a club as opposed to an outdoor yeah. festival environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like there's, if anything, like dance music has like a festival side and a club side. And the two could be completely different. For me, this is a... Yeah, because album. in a club, you have the people, they can't go anywhere. That's it. But if you play a festival and you, you miss one track, yeah. Everybody could be gone. Like, yeah. hey, this is shit. Okay, I'll go to the next tent. That's the whole thing of building a set. Mm-hmm. The, the art form of, well, I, I learned by trade. I learned, learned from people like Sasha and Digby doing back-to-backs, you know, like six hours, long mixes. Build tension. Yeah. Tell thinking, a story. Thinking yeah. about the key of tracks, even subliminally, is important. And I think earlier on, I looked and like half the tracks are more or less in the same key. Yeah. I didn't intend to do that. But, you know, it's just trying to figure out what flows. Um, I initially wanted it to be a continuous mix, the album, which mm-hmm. I'd done with one of the mixtapes where on Spotify it just mixes through. Yeah. But um, DSPs and everything don't like that. So we they, have, to, <laughs> have no. to split them up. But the idea the of algorithms it, don't like no, that. No, not at all. No. But the idea of having a continuous mix, is that's what I used to buy as a mix CD. Mm-hmm. S- slow tempo, building it on the intensity and having like, the last track, for instance, is Rhythm of the Night, which is like an encore track. Yeah. So yeah, it's trying to be thought out in that way, like I said. What I found most fascinating about this album, and also when you uh, played the guest mix on the show, is that yeah. one track would be a classic from 2001, yeah. 2002, whatever. Next track would be yours <laughs> from the album, yeah. and the next one will be a classic again. But it felt cohesive. Yeah. That's so what I'm is the, What is the secret that you recreated these sounds in a perfect way? Because we, we're talking about like it's not even a mild difference it's a, it's a galaxy of difference how the music is made in the past and how it is right now yeah I, I spent a lot of money buying the keyboards um, Access Varus mm-hmm. JP8080 um, I'm trying to go through the presets and really think about restrictions nearly yeah um, so know, instead of having a project with 100 tracks you went down like less sounds 
That's yeah, cool. that sounds. Yeah. Um, you've probably seen the video of Ferry and Armin punching away on an old computer, very limited, yeah. low RAM, low disk space, um, but they managed to make absolute classics. Yeah. And they, bar the fact they're geniuses, the restriction there must have created some sort of catalyst to make these huge anthems that yeah. to me still, still sound timeless. Fair enough, you can master tracks better now and mix them down better because the whole idea of mixing a track in the day was a nightmare, you know, like, but the elements of the melodies were thought thought of more deeply because there was restrictions there. Yeah. You had to get the melody right because yeah. there was only a certain amount of sounds you could apply yeah. to it. So yeah, that, that's sort of how I looked at it. And, and you couldn't open a project nine months later because no, everything would be gone. It. Yeah, I, that's another thing I do. I, <laughs> I can't go back to projects. I would finish a track in an hour. Like some of the album tracks, like Your Journey, I made. Wait, what? On a bus, on going up to snow bombing, I think, and like one hour, three minutes. An up hour? Speakers, and I've never had it properly mixed, but it seems to sound all right. Are you kidding me? One hour? Yeah, about that. If, if you if you go back to like GTR Mistral, Gar Emery's early yeah. one, he never had that properly mixed down. It was sort of, here's the track, and I still play that out and still sound huge because it's just a moment and a draw. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I mean, I make music very quick. I don't have one hour. Yeah, <laughs> Are you kidding ask, me? Ask Craig. <laughs> wow, that's insane. So this whole album took you twelve hours. To no, make it. <laughs> I, th I think I think one thing to say would be there's another thirty tracks there that didn't make the album. Yeah, that didn't cut it or didn't fit. You know, um, so it's that idea of having a palette of sounds to fit into an album, not just right of fourteen tracks. I have to make another two. I had a, quite a big pull. How do you how do you make the decision? decision which track is going to make it or isn't is the, that is also your manager yeah, or Craig, is it uh, Craig and James yeah, from Armada James Armada? yes um, yeah. I think James is very important because he's bringing the experience from you guys to know what works um, we should we should get James on the microphone again James could you join us for a sec James here in the studio as well clap please yeah <laughs> here it is James of Armada just pull the microphone towards you if you want to um, so question is in here here so a producer makes 30 tracks, it has to cut it down to 14 tracks. You had to kill a lot of babies, I guess. Yeah. How do you do yeah. that, James? Like, how, how do you make sure that you don't piss off each other? Well, I think we had a bit of a round robin going between Gary, Craig and I. Yeah. And it was like, right. Spreadsheet. What, yeah, spreadsheet. <laughs> what, what are your favorites, James? What are your favorites, Gary? What are your favorites, Craig? And we all, there, there was some common denominators there, but there was some other ones. So they kind of, kind of come together quite nicely actually yeah I think as you said with the mix having like one of my tracks and like a reference track or an inspirational track to be that my tracks aren't that as good as them originals it's, it's me trying to recreate that you know yeah. um, that's very humble to say well no yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it could be, take me another 10 years before I, I get there but it's that whole idea of learning but I think what we've done is try to section off different elements of what we've seen as nostalgic tracks and like I think Open Up the Night covers the Euro dance bit just in one track at the start mm -hmm. be a bit like here's a bit of rave and then the last like tracks are very pumping sort of like tech trance and it's trying to fill the gap in between and then there's like a send which is just your bang on 2000 80 80 yeah, yeah. you know melody so yeah just and just trying to get vocals in there too which it didn't get in the first album you know the, the tracks we like were the ones that have just even an essence of like humanity in them uh, just like a bit of vocal here just to add that extra sense of nostalgia um like you would have got so yeah was, i think what we tried to do was come up with like four big like, pillars in the album and base tracks around it to make a story yeah. to make the album so yeah there's a lot of tracks that didn't make it a lot of loops that weren't turned into tracks that didn't make it mm -hmm. you know that that's like how i make things like a 30 second loop i would send to um craig and then talk to James and be like, yeah, that's sort of right. Like, yes, expand on this. That was yeah. a lot of that from James saying, I think only you, that was just a loop. A yeah. Cool loop. There was like a tre treasure trove of, <laughs> yeah, just this giant folder of loops. And I was like, oh, that one sounds good. <laughs> Continue with that one. So which track on Open Up the Night is the, is the track that you as an A&R James has been, have been involved in the most or like this track wouldn't have been there without, without yeah. James. I think, um, I, I do think Only You is one that I've had on the computer for ages and it is just that, if you listen to the first breakdown, it's just that push style breakbeat mm -hmm. and 
I think James was like, can we just turn that into like a, a trance track? And like, I, I, we couldn't, we can't just leave it as this little breakbeat thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the one I went away and really worked on. And it's probably the one I'm happiest with. Um, it really get, makes me think of like an old push track there. Yeah. So that, and that's what I tried to do. You try to like connect the dots a bit. So I, I can remember that being one. Um, yeah, I think there was quite as, a few. Aslan was you, a good one, the drum and bass yeah. style one. I think there was quite a few that you already had in kind of certain stages and you know what i try and do as an a &R, i don't try and t tell you what to do i just say right well i think personally from yeah. my experience on the dance floor or in clubs or or listen to radio shows just what about changing that here there and never you know so it's just little little amendments which i just kind of suggest and yeah it wasn't out. there was i always felt like the decision decision was mine at the end of the day and yeah totally. it was just advice which is brilliant like especially on such a big label it has like history that have sort of a bit of a free reign to be creative is just so important because mm -hmm. that doesn't happen in this industry very often no. especially when you get to, you know like a lot of backing and a lot of support and a proper project style album as sometimes you get, a lot of people make decisions that um, defer from the creative process but this wasn't the case no analytics no 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 mess just pure music yeah and fun it. in the studio i guess that's it um Again, that's where I'm happiest making music, and it was just a chance to explore that. Yeah, well, you did a good job. Well, thank you, James, for answering this. Well, no um, worries. Now, I, ju I just want to jump into one thing also because I unfortunately didn't see it, even though I was there. But you made your debut for State of Trends in London. I was already on my way back to the airport when oh. you played. That was the only time I met you. Like, yes, yeah, so shook hands. Brief. Shook hands. Hey, 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 hey. bye, bye, bye. Hey, look in your USB <laughs> yeah. handshake. Bye, bye. <laughs> what was it like for you to to debut for State of Trends, and especially on your home turf? Yeah, it was, it was epic. It was such a such a big um, stage that um, it wasn't a small one. No, <laughs> no. I as I say, I, I'm, a, I'm a club DJ at heart, so it was yeah. a big difference for me to play that and that. Um, yeah, it was great. Um, and them events. All over the world, the state of trance ones are great. I remember hearing about people go to them very early on whenever I started to get into clubbing, and I was always wanting to go. Um, so to play it was just just epic. They would just share the stage with Armin, um, playing later on, and the, like the, the buzz people get, the support Armin and Armada have are, are just huge. So it was just a great, yeah, great day. Really, was seeing all the other acts as well, the people you look up to that you haven't met before. Um, it was a big thing. Yeah. yeah, quite overwhelming, to be honest. Let's do that again then. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's let's go through some of the questions real quick that came in through Instagram. Uh, Orbite wants to know, is there a track that you are the most proud of? Not necessarily the one that's your favorite, but the one that you're most proud of. Um, I suppose for Persistence, the Rhythm of the Night um, final track took a lot of effort to get, yeah. to get out um only half a decade yeah yeah it's that that's it i was made about five years ago yeah um and you would know yourself that sample clearance is a, a hard thing to do it, it's not an easy thing so to get that, that vocal cleared and to get a track that yeah, you need to get approval from a lot of yeah like publishers if you, if you, labels yeah, and stuff it, like that it's, not, use it's, the vocal, not, it's yeah. not just one person who makes the track there could be 20 people that all have to say yes yeah all over the world um um so yeah to get that released officially was just a huge moment, a great great relief um, because it it's a track I always got asked about, when's this coming out? Yeah. Oh, I heard this guy play it, or oh, I heard this DJ finish with it, you know. Um, it, it, it's just been all over the world, that track, and to have it finally released and put it on Spotify for people to access. Like a gin, not a SoundCloud, not a, no, not a TikTok. No, official not. type Official thing. release. And I actually say that's the only bootleg that's made it to see the light of day. You know, so there's like a full circle thing there to be like, here's vindication for your yeah. dodgy start. <laughs> <laughs> for the criminal start yeah. of your career. <laughs> Take the handcuffs off now. Yeah, okay, there you go. You That's a good I mean? one. So Rhythm yeah, of the Night. So, uh, there could be a more musical track there that I worked hard up, but I just think the whole thing I have in my head is persistence. Keep at it and concentrate on what you like. So that to get that out after all the hard work, you could easily be disheartened after a few years of it not getting anywhere. Yeah. So just yeah. having a good label to help with that was very important awesome um enrique b concept wants to know which songs inspired you to, for the style of your new album yeah i, th I think i've named them but um yeah it would be F ferry armin um thrill seekers lounge signum 
I'm a think if you like the 2002 to, 2003 era of trance. Yeah, I think there's Love Me Higher later track, which is like a Scott Project Signum type of thing. Mm-hmm. And I actually said I want to make a track like Scott Project and Signum, so I made it. Um, yeah, so all the stuff, all the stuff I have in vinyl. Um, yeah, basically all the all the guys that were big around 2000 when Transit blew up into the style that sort of I like. Um, yeah. Vincent de Moore, people like that. Oh yeah, um, legend. Like, like, there's a list of about thirty guys who made great music, and just to, to try and bring that back and make it make it relevant again was always the the, the idea of this project. And it, it's great to see the chase of nostalgia. Yeah, and it's great to see these <laughs> these guys back on big stages again. You yeah, know? It, it it's it's great. Um, it, it's and for some of them, it could be like second bite of the cherry. They knew how great it was the first time, and all of a sudden. People move genres and they come back to what they like. It's, it must be quite a nice feeling for these guys. And if I can help spread the word on how great the music is, that's that's half the battle. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering all these questions. There's going to be uh, for more nostalgia. I saw a little record bag standing here. Yeah. Armada is doing a really cool item uh, where you go and go through those finals. So if you yeah. want to check that out, that's on the socials as well. Thank you for answering all these questions. Thanks, Ruben. Congratulations once again on release Thanks Open of the me. Night. Uh, let's see more tunes of the weeks. You think you think you have to score a hat trick or something? Like that. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> yes, like Messi. All right. Thank you so much. This is the podcast. If you have any more questions for future uh, guests, make sure to check out the socials or drop them here in the YouTube comments. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning in. Check all previous episodes on YouTube or your favorite podcast portal. A State of Trance Podcast.